talking about uh, the Biden administration trade policies, challenges, and opportunities. So I'm just uh, going to give a brief introduction of Professor Gan before uh, we can start the session. So Professor Gans has years of experience in the field of law, not just as an academician, but also as a legal advisor, as an ad, uh, arbitrator, and as a legal consultant. Currently, he is the Will Clayton Fellow for uh, Trade International Economics at the Center for the United States and Mexico of the Baker Institute at Rice University, and also the Samuel Fidgetly Fij uh, Professor of Law at uh, Emeritus at the University of Arizona. Professor Gans is an expert in the area of international trade, investment law, regional trade agreements, international business transactions, public international law, and international environment law. He has also served uh, for the United States Department of State as the legal advisor and has practiced law at the Washington, D.C. He also served as an administrator at the NAFTA and has been a consultant to various international organizations and national organizations like the U.S. Agency for International Development, the World Bank, and the United Nations Development Program. Professor Gans has also co-authored six books, authored and co-authored six books, and has written over 75 articles that have been published in legal journals and uh, in the form of book chapters in various books. It's an absolute privilege to have you here, sir, uh, and I request you to please address our participants today. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you who have organized this very interesting and widespread con uh, conference and to CMR University uh, in this days of the pandemic, there are a few silver linings. And one of them is it is very easy for us to participate in uh, conferences that are taking place halfway around the world. So I'm certainly feeling very fortunate to be able to join you uh, to join you tonight, my time, this tomorrow in the morning, your time, uh, to be able to follow up on the excellent presentations we heard last night, your time. Um, I thought it would be useful for your audi this audience to get a sense of a question which has arisen for many in the United States, and that is how is the Biden administration trade policy going to differ from the policies of the previous administration. So that really is the focus of what I am trying to discuss in the next 15 minutes or so. If it's, there are no objections, I will put up a power plant, power, uh, PowerPoint, which I think will make it easier for everybody to um, see what we're doing. So hopefully you have a PowerPoint that starts up with the words opportunities. Is that correct? Good. Okay. Um, so uh, basically here, uh, I want to go over some of the highlights. Uh, there were obviously are some, why can't this work? Just a second. Um, the Biden administration, of course, came into office roughly 80 days ago, uh, with its major focus being on the COVID-19 disaster and the human costs, desirability of vaccinating as many people as soon as possible, and also the economic impacts of a, very, of a year which was difficult in the US. I know it was difficult, more difficult in a lot of other countries, but certainly in the US. Uh, he started out by uh, repealing a number of Trump administration policies, including uh, withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord, uh, and is in, still in a process of doing all of these things um, after a very short time in office. Uh, under the circumstances, it's pretty obvious that trade is not his highest priority, at least at the moment. Maybe it will be in six months, but it isn't now. Uh, some of you will recall that the Obama administration, which came into office uh, during the midst of the 2008-2009 uh, uh, financial crisis did not really do much of anything in trade until its second term. Um, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, but I think unfortunately, the Biden people do not have the luxury of ignoring trade uh, for any length of time because the urgency of such issues as US-China trade, uh, making the new NAFTA, USMCA work, uh, and um, trade relations with what is still 
one of our most important trading partners, the European Union, uh, they simply can't wait um, six months or a year to get attention. They have to be dealt with very, very quickly, I think. Um, I've divided the, the uh, pro this presentation basically into two areas. One that looks at those issues that really have to be dealt with soon, and the other that looks at a number of other important issues that we can probably and will probably be uh, put off. Um, the administration is in fairly good position in the sense that it's US Trade Representative, Commerce, Sec State Department, and Treasury are all headed by the Biden appointees. But of course, in the US government, just like most other governments, including India's, it's not the ministers or the secretary uh, of the agencies that do most of the work. It's the assistant secretaries and lower level officials, many of whom are political and many who, of whom have not been put in place yet. Um, the real question, I think, is the Biden administration going to be significantly less protectionist than its predecessor? And I think the, uh, the answer to that is something we really don't, we really don't know yet. But we do have to recognize, I think, that Mr. Biden's Democratic Party historically has been uh, more vocal in uh, opposing trade agreements and being in favor of uh, me measures to prevent export of jobs um, than, than the Republicans. Uh, and uh, one could be really pessimistic, as this quote suggests to you, uh, maybe the Biden administration won't be any more than Trump with manners. I don't think that's true. I think it will be different in a number of extraordinarily uh, significant respects, the most important of which is that most of our policy in trade and other areas will again become uh, one in which we consult frequently and work with our allies rather than going at it alone. Um, the phase one trade agreement with China was concluded a little over uh, 15 months ago. Uh, China made certain promises over two years uh, to reduce, uh, to reduce uh, trade penalties, uh, to reduce, I'm sorry, to reduce uh, the trade deficit, to protect uh, uh, better intellectual property more effectively, uh, to open up the Chinese economy, I think really rather modestly, uh, to financial institutions. The most important aspect of this agreement is that something like $370 billion worth of penalty tariffs on Chinese imports uh, don't go away. They're still here. They'll be here th through the rest of this agreement, at least until uh, January of next year. Um, you know, economists are pretty much united that it's not China that pays those tariffs, it's the US importers and the consumers to whom the additional costs are passed on. Uh, China has not complied with the uh, trade, with the import uh, measures, uh, and I think in part that's because of the coronavirus, particularly during uh, the first four to six months of the, um, of the disaster. Um, there are many areas of friction that go well beyond bilateral trade, uh, national security related issues with companies like Huawei and their 5G systems. Uh, supplying of uh, personal protective equipment and medicines, which the US depends heavily on uh, China and to a similar degree for medicines, at least uh, on India, uh, human rights violations in Hong Kong, Muslim communities and treatment of Taiwan. So there's a pretty long list of issues that uh, are contentious between the US and China. Uh, and again, I think it goes far beyond uh, trade matters. Um, the trade, the, uh, I think the uh, uh, phase one agreement, as I say, is there. I think there is the push for decoupling the US and Chinese economies, particularly in the areas of semiconductors and anything related to national security is going to continue under the Biden administration, but maybe, maybe in a more thoughtful and newest, nuanced uh, matter. And I think the uh, previous administration's America alone uh, policy. I, I don't think it was really an American first. It was an American alone policy uh, will be modified and has been modified already. And I think traditional US allies like the ones listed here, the EU, the UK, Australia, Canada, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea, among others, uh, will be, put, be presenting a, a common front uh, against China in a number of areas that I have shown on the slide. Uh, and of course, in the national security area, we already have uh, this quad relationship in Asia that is, seems to be moving forward of which uh, India is a part. Uh, but I think the, the Biden administration, as with many Democrats in Congress, uh, pretty much has the same concerns about um, uh, the US-China uh, economic and political uh, rivalries that we, we saw in the last four years. 
Um, I think dealing with the chairman and with the Communist Party is going to be difficult, not only now, but for years, decades in the future. Uh, clearly, China seeks to overcome the US, overtake the US in terms of GDP, and also be number one in a number of very critical areas, such as artificial intelligence, semiconductors, electric cars, robots, and those. And I think politically, there's an obvious effort that's been going on for a long time to displace US influence. And in fairness, sometimes we make that easier to, uh, to accomplish than we should. Um, so basically, uh, I think a lot of Biden's success will be restoring confidence among allies. Uh, I think it also requires a commitment to improving US education, infrastructure, government funded R&D, most of which is reflected in this recent $2 trillion legislation that was proposed a few weeks ago. Um, I think overall, if the US could figure out with the cooperation, obviously, of the Congress, how to be proactive rather than reactive, um, we would improve our situation and probably others in the world would benefit some, um, some as well. I, I think one, we're fortunate that the US Trade Representative, Catherine Tai, is really one of the great China experts in the administration. Um, there are other challenges, however, that I think we can't ignore. Most of you are familiar with what North America looks like, Canada, uh, the US and Mexico, uh, where we have had close economic relations for 26 years under NAFTA, $1.3 trillion more or less worth of trade within the region every year. So it's enormously important to the US economy's strength in the future to have this new USMCA work well. Um, there may well be some friction areas there. The labor protection provisions are much more stringent than in any other agreement we've ever uh, had before. Um, we, it's a free trade agreement, which means we have stringent rules of origin, which have gotten more complicated uh, with USMCA than they were even with NAFTA, uh, even though the customs authorities in the US are deferring most of the uh, enforcement actions until uh, July 1 of this year, it's still a big headache for a lot of companies, particularly in the auto and auto parts industry. Um, the agreement has a good, a be much better mechanism for state to state dispute resolution, which is probably a good idea since uh, certainly uh, not entirely, but because of, but mostly because of the US, the dispute settlement mechanism in uh, the WTO has essentially been neutralized. Um, we have problems dealing to some extent with the Mexican government as it currently stands because it's a, a somewhat populist administration which uh, seems to favor uh, government action rather than private investment. And dealing with that is the, I think is going to be a headache for American companies and for the administration as well. Um, we're in an interesting place as I said before because there's gonna be some resourcing movement of uh, American production, production for the US outside of, um, outside of uh, China and somewhere else. Some of it's going to go to Vietnam. I suspect uh, others places in Asia as well. Maybe some of it will come to India. Uh, but uh, because Mexico is the only relatively low labor cost country in North America, one would expect a good deal of this uh, moving of production around to end up in Mexico. But most of that depends on uh, what the investment climate looks like in Mexico over the next year or two. Um, US-EU trade relations, uh, it's, it's very important economically, and I think culturally as well, to be honest. Um, it's always been difficult. It's never really been easy for any prior administration. Uh, it's not always clear whether the EU is going to go it alone or to cooperate with us. It's not surprising if you think about what's been going on over the last four years. Um, but um, the decision to do a bilateral investment treaty between with China uh, as of um, December 30th um, was not looked on kindly by Biden officials. Uh, there's a big fight going on, and I think India is actually part of this over digital services taxes that are being imposed or threatened to be imposed by a number of the EU member countries, including and also the UK. Um, it focuses mostly on the Googles and Facebooks and similar companies. Uh, and I think that's going to be a problem because if it if it doesn't get resolved through negotiations we will end up imposing, I suspect, uh, uh, punitive tariffs on the countries that impose these taxes. Um, uh, there are some issues which it seems to me could easily, not easily, but 
relatively straightforwardly be resolved um, with um, basically getting rid of some of the trade sanctions, uh, everything from grapefruit to whiskey and lots of things in between uh, and getting rid of the steel and aluminum tariffs, uh, so-called national security tariffs, which I'll talk about more in a couple of moments. Um, I think reviving that very, very, very optimistic uh, Trans-Pacific Trade and Investment Partnership that was negotiated to a very limited degree under the Biden administration is probably a waste of time. It simply isn't going to happen. Uh, but there may be possibilities around the edges. Uh, World Trade Organization, as we all know, uh, chances of major reforms, I think, in the WTO that would satisfy many US concerns that go back in many cases to the Bush administration, uh, in my opinion, simply is not going to happen. Uh, you have a consensus requirement in the WTO and you can, we, I think one can reasonably expect that you, uh, you will have strong opposition uh, to any major changes from China, India, South Africa, and probably quite a few others. Um, again, US concerns are, sure, are shown here. I've got about three or four minutes, so I've got to get going. Um, uh, mostly uh, over anti-subsidy, anti-dumping issues, uh, and the difficulty of a 25, 26 year old um, set of agreements to deal effectively with uh, centrally planned economies and also the issue of self-designation of developing country status. The first one is not very important to India. The second one I suspect is very important. Uh, this whole area of special and differential treatment. Uh, the Biden administration made some, I think, positive earlier steps uh, supporting the consensus behind the new um, secretary general they reaffirmed U.S. support for the WTO in very nonspecific and general term and for an international trading system, but they are still blocking appellate, uh, a, the appointment of appellate body judges, which incidentally began in the last months of the Obama administration. It was not something that Trump came up with. It, he just continued it. Um, again, I think the, 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 the differences that have been going on for several decades, maybe three or four decades, US, Japan, and the EU on one side, and India, China, Russia, and South Africa on the other. Uh, seems to me that the WTO is going to be increasingly uh, irrelevant when it comes to trade liberalization. And if efforts by uh, South Africa and India to uh, discourage plurilateral agreements, those you know, among a group of WTO members rather than the entire membership uh, at the, the WTO at Geneva, the WTO will become even, in my view, will become even less important in the future. Um, Section 232 tariffs very quickly, so-called um, national security tariffs imposing steel and aluminum tariffs or quotas on pretty much all of our uh, import sources of imports, including our closest allies. Um, I don't think it, it made much sense from the beginning. It probably doesn't make any more sense today, but it's really hard once they get started to get rid of them. <clears throat> the Biden administration is at least as beholden to the steel industry and to steel workers unions as uh, was Mr. Trump. So uh, I don't think any of us should accept that the, expect that there's gonna be a change here in the foreseeable future. Uh, I think it's very unfortunate. I think it makes it harder for us to do more with our allies, a broader group of allies, a group of 20, including India, of course, but I don't think that's, any change is going to happen there. Other trade priorities I'll go through very quickly. Uh, US should be rejoining the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. I don't think we'll be doing so in the near future. It would have significant economic and political benefits for us, but I think Congress would oppose. Uh, US-UK free trade agreement uh, probably is a big de bigger deal for the UK than it is for us after breakfast. Uh, I don't think that's gonna happen quickly at all. And the more violence we see in Ireland, the less likely it is that the US is going to rush into anything here. I would guess not until 2023. Um, minor spat between Trump and Vietnam over currency manipulation. I think that's pretty much gone away, although it has been raised in some bilateral meetings in recent weeks. Um, and uh, India, I, I think it's difficult. I think uh, both countries have become considerably more protectionist in, um, in the last three or four months or six months than was the case before. Uh, and I don't really see much change happening. Uh, India was graduated from GSP, I guess a year or so ago. Uh, at the moment, GSP is not in force. It, it, it disappeared as of January 1, it'll come back eventually. And at that point, I assume there will be some decisions, some discussions between the two governments over uh, India's status in that 
all important uh, uh, permission to export a lot of manufactured goods to the US duty free. Um, we have a special trade promotion authority law, as most of you know, it goes away after June 30th. It means it's very hard for the US uh, administration to negotiate trade agreements until they get it renewed. Uh, last time it went away, it took six years to get renewed. Hopefully it won't take that long here, but that's another factor discouraging new regional trade agreements. Um, there's some discussions with Kenya that have been going on with the uh, Trump administration. I doubt that the Biden administration will pursue these in the near future, and at least from US previous policies, it would make a lot more sense for us to be negotiating with the broader group, with the uh, African Regional uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement that was just put into force. Um, if the US recovers from the pandemic by mid-fall, which I think mostly will happen, uh, the economy becomes stronger, then the administration becomes in a better position to pursue trade le liberalization at the global level, level, which I think is probably a waste of time, and also at the regional levels, but I don't think anyone around that I've talked to has really major expectation that this is going to happen. So let me wrap up. Um, Biden, is, Biden is not dif different from other presidents coming into office. Trade is often not on the front burner. Um, the American loan policies are going to go away very quickly, um, and we will have a more uh, multilateralized in relationships, both trade and politics. But whether that changes the basic trade policies, I think, is another question. We can hope, I think, that the Biden group, which seems to be very competent coming out of the, out of the uh, binders, um, will develop trade policies in time. Uh, they have to look at national interests. They have to operate effectively. As you, most of you know, we have a 10 vote, the Democrats have a 10 vote margin in Congress and 50-50 it is in the Senate with an election coming up in a year and a half. So I think there are possibilities for, uh, for significant new initiatives, but there won't be very many of them and they will be very hard to achieve. Thank you.